All right, so we still got two minutes left in 2020. So as promised, <laughs> as promised, we're gonna do the letter that wasn't really a letter. I don't really want to editorialize it too much. Uh, I'm gonna be giving commentary on it, I guess, for the rest of 2021, if we're lucky. Um, maybe probably for the next decade, but the point is this was a letter, well, I never sent it, and as I mentioned before, it was never written in the second person of you did this, and you know, so it's not really a letter, or at least it's not a letter to my parents, um, but it's very much about them. It's about um, the kind of shitty parenting and the shitty parents that they were, but this was written in December. It was the last modification on the file was December 12, uh, December, no, 12 months, December 12, uh, December 6, 2006. I quit college the year before. I was at my own apartment. I had been there for almost a year. And um, this is what I wrote. And if you want to, well, if you want to read the whole thing, I'll link to it in the time uh, timestamps. It's going to be grero.com slash letter dot html if you just want to read along what I'm reading right now. So, life in the happy face dictatorship, emotional child abuse, and emotional rape. Imagine a world where a child isn't allowed to develop normally. His mother pathologically clings to him to keep him down with lies meant to terrorize the child. His father either ignores the abuse or eggs it on. In this world, love is not unconditional, but a cheap commodity that is given as a reward and taken away as a punishment. The child is in, the, is in reality the property of the parents while the propaganda blasts everyone's equal in this family. Emotions are considered dangerous and unnecessary. Problems are repressed and forgotten. Privacy and choice and are non-existent. Paranoia, criticism, and hysteria make up the triumvirate that holds power. For about two decades, that was my life. I'm no longer going to be silent. I have a few things to say. My first memory of my mother. I was no more than four years old when I remember a walk along the creek to the edge of the forest with my mother. I climbed near a fence and tried to skip each bar with a rose bush sticking through the bars. My mother told me to stop. Annoyed that I continued, she, she started screaming that if I didn't stop, she'd send me to an orphanage. She told me orphanages are places where disobedient children get sent. Not only was this scare tactic way out of line, but it was a direct assault on normal child development. My mother was not protecting me. She was protecting her power over me against my growing independence. This unforgivable betrayal aimed at stifling and breaking my spirit was merely the first step among thousands of daily betrayals I experienced over the next decade and a half. Uh, if you're hearing anything in the background, by the way, as I said, it's two minutes before midnight and uh, it is New Year's. So. The next 15 year uh, tyranny by threats. The threat of abandonment continued past my first memory of my mother and was probably the single most used tool, although stifling my independence, belittlement, emotional blackmail, and plain verbal abuse ranked high on the list of ways to keep me in line. A few chronological samples. <laughs> this is supposed to be a serious letter. There is a cat crying outside. It's not my cat, but in case it's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's picking it up, but it is, it sounds like either like a New Year's Eve blowing thing. I know it's a cat. It sounds like a child almost. It's a cat. Anyways, let's move on. A few chronological examples. Okay, I'm distraught. The, the next 15-year tyranny by threats. The threat of abandonment continued past my first memory of my mother and was probably the single most used tool, although stifling my independence, belittlement, emotional blackmail, and plain verbal use abuse ranked high on the list of ways to keep me in line. A few chronological samples. They're out to get you. Most kids are rightly told not to talk to strangers. 
However, few children are told to be on the alert for any stranger because anyone could be a drug dealer intent on ruining their life. They're going to give you the first pills for free and then they're going to want your money. I still remember the words of my mother because few five-year-olds worry about bankruptcy due to a possible drug habit. The implicit message that was reinforced in me was that I'm not safe anywhere. Everyone's out to get me. Trust no one. Orphanage again. Perhaps when I was five, I noticed a bird's nest in the yard. I heard baby birds chirping and decided to help out by attaching worms to the end of a stick and dropping them into the nest. My mother saw this and started screaming like a lunatic. Once again, she threatened to send me to a place where they send bad kids. My intention was to help. I was not harassing the birds. Even if I were, my mother's response was out of line and disproportionate. Instead of telling me about how nature worked, she chose to overreact and to terrorize me. Before we came to America, I was told that if I don't behave correctly in the remaining months, I would be left behind. As with the previous orphanage threats, this latest threat was merely a ruse to get me to behave by scaring me shitless. This hallmark of terrorist parenting worked. I obeyed because I believed the threat. But to a small child, being threatened with abandonment is far more tangible and thus worse than even being threatened with death. Taking away self-defense. In the first few months of school in America, there was a bathroom incident in which a student pushed me away from the urinal. I pushed him back, and his fall knocked down a cheap plywood wall. We were both sent to the principal's office. When my mother picked me up, she started screaming at me. Despite the fact that all the students in the bathroom said I was not at fault, my mother told me that they deport us because of what I had done. As usual, I bought the story. Until this very letter, never again would I stand up for myself and thus became an easy punching bag both at school and home. Worth as much as a coat. The same year, I lost my coat during recess. Since, I, since it got hotter in the day, my mother and I didn't notice my coat missing until we got home. Since it was a Friday, I could only search for the coat the next week. My mother became enraged and threatened to send me back to Hungary over a $50 coat. Much to my relief, the coat was found in the lost and found on Monday. I was worth as much as a coat. You would appreciate us more if we had beaten you, which is my mother now. Big Brother is watching you. The next year in the fourth grade, my mother decided to start volunteering. In a city of two million, she chose to show off her civic spirit by volunteering at my school. In a school of perhaps 40 teachers, she chose to become my teacher's assistant. My mother pressured me to let her stay in my class. There literally wasn't a minute that year that I was out of my mother's sight. Mama's boy. In the sixth grade, my mother insisted that she ride the school bus for the first two weeks of school to test out the route. This involved my father getting out of work, dropping her, dropping her off at my school, and then her coming home on the bus with me. It was amazingly embarrassing to have my mother ride the bus. Later, she would wait at the bus stop for me despite that our apartment was a few hundred feet away. While I might have gotten away with having braces, glasses, and good grades, being a mama's boy guaranteed that I became such a bully magnet that I had to switch, switch schools at the end of the year after bullies broke my glasses and shoved me off the bleachers, among other such near weekly incidents. Because I was, never, I was always told never to fight back or face the wrath of my parents, I never stood up for myself and not allowed others to treat me like dirt. Big Brother is still watching him. I used to swim at a local community center. A bridge and two lanes before and after it separated the community center from the apartment complex. Until sometime during the freshman year of high school, my mother would stand outside the complex and watch me cross the bridge into the community center. Once I was inside the building, I was required to make a telephone call just in case. On the rare occasion that I forgot to call, what happened? Were rescue teams dispatched to make sure I didn't die in the lobby, which was usually filled with dozens of people? No, I was simply screamed at for not calling when I got home two hours later after practice was over. Thus, the only reason for the phone calls was to ease the completely irrational paranoid fears of my mother. Threat of abandonment continues. During sophomore year of high school, there were baseless allegations of me doing drugs, laughably so because my schedule was completely filled up and I didn't have a car. 
Despite having a better than 4.0 GPA, I was accused of being lazy and my parents would constantly laugh in my face that I was going to fail tests. This was called encouragement. Later, I was threatened with being sent to military school due to these failing grades. By this time, I was smart enough to figure out that this was just a ploy. But there were brochures and the threats kept coming. If we die, you have nobody, was the usual cheerful reminder. Unreal expectations. In my family, the adults were the only ones who wanted to go to the Olympics. My mother expected me to excel to literally Olympic levels in three sports, speed, speed, uh, speed skating, swimming, and water polo. In her recent discussion with my mother, her fantasy world devoid of any reality was revealed. She, re she remarked that I could have gone to the Olympics if I only tried harder. The fact that you have to, uh, to be probably twice my way to even have a chance never crossed her mind. If you, think you, you can, if you can think it, you can do it, was the implicit motto. More correctly, the slogan goes, if you can't do what your mother wants you to do, there's hell to pay. The only possibilities for a profession were doctor or lawyer. Anything else was looked down upon and strongly dis as strongly discouraged regardless of my desires. Actual physical abuse. During junior year, I became depressed realizing that there was no way out of the invisible dictatorship no one even knew existed. I was put on some light medication despite that I knew the problem was not spontaneous and internal but reactive. The side effects were as if my pulse stopped and only restarted with electric shocks that made me slightly twitch for about an hour after taking the pills. A few weeks passed and I felt worse than before. After, in, after the intense side effects that made me slam a few books down from the bookcase, I calmed down and resolved to stop taking the pills. My parents arrived back shortly after and saw the small mess. In her usual style, my mother started screaming and rhetorically asked if I was going to burn the apartment down. I lost my calm and started breathing heavily. I tried to get out of my room to run out the door, but my mother blocked me. Like a gorilla, she shoved me into the adjacent bathroom and pushed me into the bathtub. She then turned the cold water on me. We don't know where we went wrong. We always treated you like an adult. My mother commonly remarks on her parenting. Cycle of Manipulation The years of abuse had its toll on me. I was severely underweight because I was too depressed to eat and swam four or two hours each day. I was chronically sleep deprived because of either too much homework or my inability to sleep due to stress. I frequently wish I wouldn't wake up. In the manner of a vampire, my mother would quench her insatiable thirst for drama by sucking the life out of me by starting verbal fights designed to suck me in. The cycle of manipulation would involve her baiting me into an argument, provoking me to be rude, then demanding sympathy in the form of my father screaming at me or me asking for forgiveness for being offended. Here's the usual dialogue. Mother, did you get your Spanish test back? Me, yeah, I got a 95 on it. Mother, you're letting your grade slip. Me, um, it was the high, second highest grade in the class. Mother, you will have to study harder. You're going to fail if this continues. Me, ir irritated, raised voice. I have an A in the class. I'm perfectly fine. Mother, why are you screaming at me? Did your internet friends teach you to be rude to me? Me. I'm fucking sorry that you're unable to understand that my grades are fine. Mother, you don't appreciate what we do for you. You're not paying for you're not paying for you to go to private school so that you play on the computer all day long. Me. I have good grades. Mother, you're trying to give me a heart attack. You want to kill me, killer. My mother would then go to her bedroom and sulk until I gave her an apology. My father was not absent from most of these arguments and stories. Usually, he got angry and screamed at me. He always took my mother's side. This pleased my mother because she got her high off the nectar of sympathy. For example, the day before we evacuated from the hurricane, my mother tried the usual bait-provoked demand game with me, but I refused to play along and walked outside. Damned if I, damned if I don't, my, uh... A damned if I do, damned if I don't, my mother started the usual hissy fit trying to evoke sympathy. My father came out after me and told me that I shouldn't be disrespectful and that, quote, your mother has a right to kill you because she gave birth to you. As with the code incident, I'm once again disposable property that can be dumped on whim. At times, my father would get physical. Oddly, my mother, who provoked my father to hit me, then would tell my father to stop and she herself would comfort me. 
After feeding off riling my father up, she subconsciously wanted him to hurt me so she could then save me. One minute, I was the villain who had to be hated, the next, someone to be rescued and loved. Such mixed messages or splitting behavior is a common symptom of borderline personality disorder. The most curious manifestation of my mother's manipulative messiah complex happened three days after I graduated from high school with a 4.10 GPA. I went to Walmart to buy basic hygiene products like rubbing alcohol and band-aids. When I got back, my mother started screaming about how expensive all this stuff was. She successfully hooked me into the bait-provoked demand game, and my father rushed out at me. Even though I was almost 19, I still shriveled up all afraid on the couch expecting a punch. Then my mother begged my father not to hit me. Apparently, intent with just terrorizing me, punched but purposefully missed and ran off to the bathroom. Having had enough, I put on my shoes and walked to the door, hoping to spend the rest of the day on a park bench. My mother, who just a few minutes ago was ranting on about how I was trying to kill her, calmly said, Please stay. There's no need to go. My mother's transition was so unusually abrupt, even for her, that I remember running away from the apartment as fast as I could. All these stories of abuse were buried in the past. None of these, uh, none of these, uh, that, the failure, I bet this one was a typo. Um, it was bound to explode ir irrevocably. The stories told are a small fraction of a story that could span thousands of pages. The stories told are a small fraction of a story that could span thousands of pages. That, that's in the original. These are merely the most illustrative and the ones that keep repeating in my head. But now the water has boiled over and the reign of terror is over. Oh, or so I thought. The sadism is over. The hate is over. The torture is over. The dictatorship has fallen after two decades. The cracks started appearing during, the high school, during high school as I realized I wasn't responsible for, what's amounts, for what amounts to serious illness on the part of my mother, or mental illness on the part of my mother. The tyranny started collapsing full speed about a year ago when I quit college to start a business. Its purpose was to provide my financial independence to get out from under the thumbs of my parents. I had frequently fantasized about running away ever since I was 16. I no longer give consent to be treated like trash. My parents can find a new marionette to play with. I am a person and no one has a right to kill me. In an ironic twist of poetic justice, it is not me who is being discarded, and it is not me who is now being abandoned. I hate to say it, but I feel physically sick and scared in the presence of my parents, quite the achievement even for the two dedicated monsters. I see no reason why it would be beneficial for me to keep close contact with my parents. I don't want any contact anymore, because I want to stop drowning and start living. So that concludes the letter that really isn't a letter, but nonetheless, it airs my complaints from 2006 about high school and before and all that. And um, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm glad it's out there. You know, it took uh, 14 years, I guess 15, because now it's 2021 as we finish this um, 15th year. And uh, hopefully it's not going to take that many more to uh, get through this. So anyways, that's it. You know, it, it's just like with, um, what do you call it? Just like with other things, yeah, put this out there. Um, I'm not sure when I'm going to next get back next get back into commenting on this or going through with it a little more. But it's out there. And, uh, you know, I'll take my sweet time and that's it. So, uh, yeah, have a happy new year. Uh, hopefully 2021 is uh, better than... 2020 was no, but 2020 wasn't yeah it was it was interesting you know there were some problems and i'm not going to get into it that, that'll be a whole other new audio video thing uh 2020 in review but that's not now and have a great new year